thank you so much for listening to this Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety podcast about paternal health and the risk of blood clots. I'm Michael Wong, Executive Director of the Physician Patient Alliance. With me today are Colleen Lee, who is Maternal Perinatal Patient Safety Officer at Montefiore Medical Center, located in Bronx, New York, and Pat Iyer, a legal nurse consultant who provides education to healthcare providers about patient safety. Pat, the Physician Patient Alliance is so pleased to have you host, host uh, this podcast. Wonderful, Michael. Thank you so much. In this program, as I talk with Colleen, we will be discussing the risks of pregnant women and women who have delivered who are at risk for developing a blood clot or a venous thromboembolism. And Colleen, I wanted to start off by telling you about Greta, who is a woman who delivered her child and developed signs of a massive pulmonary embolism or a blood clot in her lungs. But before we talk about her, just in general, what are some of the risk factors that women experience for the development of a blood clot? So particularly during pregnancy, women are at risk for blood clots to develop because of a combination of factors. There is something called Burkow's triad, which just means that there's three things that are happening during pregnancy and the postpartum period, venous stasis, endothelial injury, and the fact that the woman is in a hypercoagulable state. And essentially, with all these three things happening, it puts the woman at increased risk for blood clots to form, in addition to other things like perhaps being on extended bed rest after a surgery such as a cesarean delivery, um, extra weight in the abdomen, you know, putting pressure on the lower extremities, and basically things like that related to the pregnancy. You mentioned venous stasis, and some of the people who are listening to this podcast may be unaware of what that term means. Could you explain that? Sure, sure. That's a great idea. Um, so venous stasis, simply put, just means that the blood that is in the vein is not moving. It's not flowing back towards the heart, which it should be doing, and it's just basically staying in one place. Okay. And then what about endothelial injury? What could that be? So endothelial injury refers to little um, micro damage in the vessel walls, so the, the walls of the vein become slightly injured or, or damaged, and it really happens as a result of the strain of the pregnancy itself, where there's an increased blood flow as well as that increased pressure from, you know, uh, more weight in the abdominal area. And then the third piece of the triad was the hypercoagulable state. What could that mean? And that would mean that due to a series of factors, uh, hormone changes, uh, pregnancy changes, such as an increased blood flow in the maternal circulation, which, is, which happens in order that the baby will get the appropriate amount of oxygen and nutrition, the woman becomes at increased risk for forming blood clots just sort of uh, spontaneously, which most other women would not be at risk for if they were not pregnant. How long after delivery is a woman at elevated risk for a blood clot? So the risk is present all the way throughout a pregnancy, from the first trimester through the end of the pregnancy, and then it does last up to about 12 weeks postpartum or after delivery. How common is it for women to experience one of these pregnancy-related blood clots after delivery? So that's a great question, Pat. After the delivery, there are sort of two stages of risk. And we do know that the woman's greatest risk for a blood clot is to occur in the first six weeks. At that time, she's almost 
10 times more likely than a non-pregnant woman to develop a blood clot. After the sixth week, between the seventh and twelfth weeks postpartum, she has a significantly decreased risk. However, she's still almost twice as likely as non-pregnant women to develop a blood clot at that time. I would imagine with that risk being present that one of the important components of healthcare would be patient education. What would you explain to a woman who had delivered about the symptoms that might indicate that there could be a blood clot forming? Very good question, and, and yes, you're right, very important to not only educate our healthcare providers about this, but our patients, because they're a member of the team, for sure. So uh, particularly uh, while they're still in the hospital is a great opportunity, you know, for some patient education to be done by the nurses and the physicians and prior to discharge. And I would definitely want patients to be counseled that any sort of chest pain or pressure, difficulty breathing, um, certainly if that's severe, but I would I would even err on the side of even if it doesn't feel like it's that bad, I would still want to question it and address it. And then any kind of swelling or pain in the legs. Could you explain how a clot would cause those symptoms that are so significant warning signs? Sure. So basically, um, to put it simply, a clot forms as a result of those factors that I mentioned earlier, the venous stasis in particular. And what that means is that because of all the pregnancy-related changes occurring in the woman's body, the circulation is not as effective as it normally is. And what that means is that the veins in particular are what carry the blood back from the lower extremities and the rest of the body to the heart. In the lower extremities in particular, if the blood is not circulating back to the heart as, it, as well as it should be, it's staying in one place basically. And when blood sort of sits in one place, it has a tendency to clump together and at that point may form clots. So if a clot is formed in a blood vessel, like a vein, the tissue there starts to become swollen. It can cause pain. And then certainly if this process occurs in any of the pulmonary vessels, meaning the vessels around the lungs, that can lead to an even more severe issue of the lungs not being properly oxygenated and causing those symptoms of severe pain in the chest or shortness of breath. We're talking about some really serious symptoms and also consequences when you discuss tissue death. What can the healthcare providers do to try to prevent the progression of those symptoms and the tissue destruction? So probably the single most important thing that the healthcare team can do is risk assessment and preventative measures for those women who are found to be at higher risk. So some of the preventative measures that can be taken for a woman who's found to be at higher risk are mechanical prophylaxis, or another way to think about that are the graduated compression stockings, which are, um, you know, put on the lower extremities to sort of help the blood flow back to the heart. Also, there are sequential compression devices, which are mechanical stockings, if you will, that go on the lower extremities and serve that purpose as well. They, they sort of serve as a pump for the blood to go back to the heart. And then, of course, there's also medication which can be administered. And that medication would be anticoagulant um, medication such as heparin to help the blood prevent clots from forming. 
At the beginning of this program, I talked with you about Greta, who developed a, a massive pulmonary embolism. And it certainly is a common cause of death and illness in pregnant women or in women in the postpartum period or as well as other people who can develop a pulmonary embolism. But a saddle embolism is a very specific term. What does that mean? So to put that very simply, a saddle embolus is basically a type of pulmonary embolus that can be large enough to block circulation to the lungs. And it is a very um, serious complication, and it can cause preventable maternal death. And what I mean by preventable maternal death are what I was talking about just a few moments ago in that ideally if we identify women who are at increased risk, we can intervene early enough to prevent such a serious complication as a saddle embolus. What are the symptoms of that condition? Of the saddle embolus would be severe shortness of breath, syncope or fainting, um, or dizziness, and chest pain. Okay. And could they be present in other conditions, those symptoms? So that's one of the problems I think that all of us sort of grapple with in this realm is that these are very vague symptoms. They, you know, they could be related to any number of conditions, some of which are not nearly as serious. And I think that that's partly why this is such a serious problem is because it, it may very well not be recognized early enough. So I think that that's, again, to go back to that patient education component to really, really drive home the point that even if they don't think there's something wrong, if they experience any of these types of symptoms, that it is very important that they call the doctor and have it addressed as soon as possible. And then the last question I had for you is I know that you were part of a panel that developed the OB venous thromboembolism safety recommendations. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience and the impact that those recommendations might have on this very serious problem? Sure, Pat. I think, um, you know, it's been really wonderful over the last few years that I have had the opportunity to work on these OB VTE safety recommendations and also um, with other groups that are focusing on this as well. And I, I think it's great that there's an increased attention on this problem because it's a very important problem and it, and it really is a serious preventable cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. So my hope with the recommendations is that it will raise awareness among both providers and patients about the seriousness and the risk of venous thromboembolism in pregnancy. And I think the take-home message with these recommendations and with what we're talking about here is that the importance of risk assessment and prevention is really the key factor here. If we identify women who are at risk early enough and we implement preventative measures such as the mechanical boots or stockings, um, along with possibly medical intervention, like anticoagulant therapy, we can seriously decrease the severe morbidity and mortality associated with VTE in pregnant women. And I think that these OB VTE safety recommendations do offer a very comprehensive guide for the healthcare team in risk assessment, prevention, prophylaxis, and treatment of the most common forms of VTE in pregnancy, such as deep vein thrombosis, DVT, and pulmonary embolus, PE. It certainly sounds like these recommendations have helped to focus attention on a deadly issue for women who have delivered and the, the families affected by such catastrophic events. The more we can focus on those issues and improve patient safety, the better off we'll be regarding this particular 
serious complication of pregnancy. Oh, I, I very much agree. And I, it's, it's very exciting to see so much attention on this, on this matter because I, I do think it's something that it can be addressed, maybe not easily, but I think with the right attention and, and the right, you know, groundwork being laid, I, I really do think it's fixable. Thank you, Colleen, for joining us today on behalf of the Physician-Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. You may obtain more information about the work of this organization at www.ppahs.org. Thank you, Pat.